Okay, we begin unit five on free will, starting with this video lecture. In this lecture, we're just kind of going to introduce the issues and give a very bird's eye view, an overview of uh, the topic of free will and specifically what interests philosophers in free will. Um, so we're kind of just going to skirt around here and there, hither and thither. And um, just kind of get an overview of kind of what there is to think about and why it's such an interesting topic, why it's such an important topic. And um, yeah, I don't think I need to motivate any further, though. I think it's just intrinsically interesting, and I think a lot of people will agree. So here's a quick question. Let me tell you a story real quick, actually. The story is called The Dinghy. So one day, me, Davis, was in the middle of Lake Michigan hanging out in his dinghy. Davis was roughly one mile from shore. Suddenly a storm broke out. Water began to flood into his dinghy and Davis quickly realized that his dinghy was sinking. Davis's only chance of making it to the shore alive was to jettison his cargo that was also on board in order to lighten the load on his dinghy and prevent his dinghy from sinking. So Davis tossed his cargo overboard and made it safely to shore. Question. Was Davis forced to throw his cargo overboard? Think about it. Most people would say yes. Given that Davis was going to drown if he didn't throw the cargo overboard, Davis had no choice but to throw it. All right, fair enough. I'm going to tell a slightly different story, also called the dinghy. One day, Davis was in the middle of Lake Michigan hanging out in his dinghy. Davis was roughly one mile from shore. Suddenly, a storm broke out. Water began to flood into his dinghy, and Davis quickly realized that his dinghy was sinking. Davis's only chance of making it to the shore alive was to jettison his mother, that was also on board, in order to lighten the load on his dinghy and prevent his dinghy from sinking. So Davis tossed his mother overboard and made it safely to shore. Oh. <laughs> Question, was Davis forced to throw his mother overboard? Think about it. All right. Most people would say no. But there's, notice something though. There was, the only difference between the second and first story is one word. I replaced the word cargo with mother in the second story. So Davis was, quote, forced to throw his cargo overboard but not, quote, forced to throw his mother overboard. So, if, and that, according to most people when they hear both these stories, maybe you thought differently because I've trained you well so far as philosophers. But most people say, yes, Davis was forced to throw his cargo overboard, and no, Davis was not forced to throw his mother overboard, even though the only difference between the two stories is cargo and mother, those two words. So that proves that either... One, most people are equivocating on the meaning of the word force, or most people are just inconsistent. So, uh, and I'm not really sure what the answer is, if they're equivocating or if it's inconsistent. Uh, but it is an interesting issue, and I bring up this story because it's a way to start getting us thinking about uh, terms like being forced to do something, or not being forced to doing something. So if you do something and you're not forced to do it, in many cases we'd say you did it freely. But if you did something and you were forced to do it, then we'd say you did not do it freely. But the question is, what is it to be forced to do something? And this will be important as we look at issues about free will. So, like I said, this unit's on free will and determinism. And let's take a look briefly at both free will and determinism, the concepts, the theories, the theses, whatever you want to call them. So, so there's this tension. And obviously the tension is going to be between free will and determinism. Most of us can agree that a person who could not do otherwise than perform a certain action is not morally responsible for performing it, and so should not be praised or blamed for it. Ooh, I got an email. So again, if you did something, but it was not possible for you to do otherwise than what you did, then you're not morally responsible for it, so you shouldn't be praised or blamed for it. For example, 
Suppose Jones robbed money from a bank. But suppose that Jones did the bank robbery because Jones was hypnotized. Well, then we would, if we found out that Jones robbed the bank because he was hypnotized, he was under hypnosis, someone else hypnotized him, we would not be inclined to blame Jones for the bank robbery. Perhaps we would instead blame the person that hypnotized Jones. Similarly, if Jones was hypnotized, but as a result of Jones' hypnosis, he began to help elderly ladies to cross the street, we wouldn't praise Jones either. Yes, he's helping old ladies cross the street, but he's doing it because he's hypnotized. It's like he's not really in control of himself. Something else is in control of him. So given that he's hypnotized, he can't do otherwise than what he's doing at the moment. As you sit there comfortably, take a moment to put your hands on your lap. And once you put your hands on your lap, you may begin to focus on the center of the spiral. And it's interesting because as you focus on the center of the spiral, your shoulders begin to relax. And the more you focus, the more relaxed you become. So we tend to assume that moral responsibility requires acting voluntarily of one's own free will. You're not going to be morally responsible for doing some action unless you did it freely. Further, the idea that we may live in a universe in which there is no one is morally responsible for their actions seems difficult to take seriously. If someone robs you and you get mad at them, it seems rational to be mad at someone who's just robbed you. Because it's, well, basically because you... They're morally responsible. Well, they freely robbed you. They shouldn't have done that. They didn't have to do that. It's the basic assumption. If someone steals from you, if someone punches you for no reason, uh, our, it seems like our justice system assumes free will. I think we all assume free will. This philosopher, uh, Strassen, said that we have these things called reactive attitudes. It's, it's ways we react to other people. And these attitudes are justified because, or actually only they are justified only if, the people who we're reacting to are doing such things freely. So we get mad at our boss for stiffing us in our paycheck. Well, it's not just that we're upset about the circumstances. We're mad at our boss because we assume our boss has free will and did the wrong thing, but did not have to do the wrong thing. And so on, etc. So I'm trying to motivate this. All right. We, well, at least I, believe that it is up to us, or at least it's up to me, to perform many of the actions we perform. For example, you, Phil One Ten students, can continue to pay attention to what's on these slides, or you can do otherwise. That is, instead of paying attention to me right now, you could be playing on your iPhone, or you could be daydreaming about Breaking Dawn Part 2, or you could be going to sleep, or you could be browsing Facebook, and so on. There's many other things you could be doing right now, like literally that you have the ability to be doing right now. Of course, there are limits. You can't do anything for example you can't turn into a wampa but that doesn't mean you don't have free will free will means that uh there's more than one option available to you and you can freely choose the options that are available to you okay so that doesn't mean you have any you have the power to do anything it just means that you have options you have alternative possibilities you can either be watching this right now or you could be not okay so yeah you still have a large range of possible courses of action all right, so this leads to what I'm going to call the free will thesis, which can be expressed simply as this. If you have free will, I then you know, then some of your behavior is such that you could have done otherwise. In other words, it is up to you. So you could be doing something other than watching this video right now. It is up to you to be watching this video right now. This is a pretty plausible thesis, and I think most of us at least act as if we believe it all the time or else we wouldn't react to other people in the way I've illustrated. We wouldn't get mad at people for doing things that we think are wrong unless we thought in some sense that it was up to the person who did it to not do it. But there's this other thesis, which we'll call the determinism thesis. And it's also going to be quite plausible as well. We'll, ex we'll, start, we'll express it first and then we'll um, elaborate on, upon what I mean by it. So here is the determinism thesis. Given the past and the laws of nature, there is only one possible future. All right, that's the thesis. So here's the big picture. Given the state of the universe at time zero, we'll say that's the Big Bang, 
and the laws of nature that govern this particular universe, you know, laws about gravitation, about the behavior of atoms, and so on, every event after time zero is necessita necessitated by the state of the universe at time zero and the laws of nature. All right, what do I mean by that? Well, let's take a look at an example that we're all familiar with. Take a portion of H2O molecules, uh, water, and we'll say that it's in a liquid state. So take liquid water. Well, we suppose we put it in a chamber at some time t, you know, like a freezer. And the temperature of that chamber at time t is less than 32 degrees Fahrenheit, all right? So we put some water in the freezer, basically. That's all that little bullet point means. All right, so that's the state, all right? That's the initial state. Bullet point two, H2O molecules in liquid state freeze at a certain rate when the temperature of the H2O molecules is less than 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Basically, water, you know, becomes solid. It freezes at uh, temperatures of 32 degrees Fahrenheit or less, all right? Everyone knows this. Water freezes at 32F, all right? So that's a law of nature. Water freezes at 32F. All right, well, given this, the fact that we put some water in the freezer, and given the fact that water freezes at a, uh, this temperature range, we can infer the following. The H2O molecules will be in a solid state at some precise time t in later than t. In other words, that water is going to freeze soon. So the past, then, putting and the laws of nature necessitate or determine that the H2O freezes. All right. Imagine if H2O didn't behave in this predictable, natural law-abiding manner. So imagine if water didn't behave in these predictable ways, in these lawful ways. Well, so for example, suppose that the temperature of the water in your body, and by the way, our bodies are made up of a lot of water. There's a lot of water in our bodies right now. So imagine if it didn't, um, so suppose the temperature of the water in your body were 98.6 but H2O didn't have to follow these laws of nature. It didn't have to boil at a certain point or freeze at a certain point. Instead, it could freeze at any temperature or boil at any temperature. So it was unpredictable and chaotic. Well, then you could, you know, freeze or spontaneously combust. In other words, that would suck, all right? We want water to behave in lawful ways. So, well, this is kind of like why we think determinism is a good thing then. We want nature to behave in predictable ways. Then when we learn about nature, we can avoid certain disasters and we can control it for our own ends, all right? We can predict, for example, severe weather events. And the reason we're able to better at predicting tornadoes and hail and hurricanes is because we have a better understanding of how, of the laws of, you know, nature when it can, pertains to weather. And the fact is, it doesn't really tend to change. Uh, these laws kind of just hold at all times, all right? And that's how it is in a lot of the sciences, and it's a good thing that the world operates in this regular kind of manner, all right? All right, so we can take determinism in the thesis that everything is kind of law-governed. All right, well, here's something to think about. Take you at this very moment, all right? You are in a certain state right now, or a, okay? That, that state of you includes all your desires, your beliefs, your attitudes, your tastes, your values, your allergies, your addictions, your body temperature, your weight, your height, your eye color, and so on. Basically, every fact that there is about you is your state of you at this moment. So think about it. Take a moment to introspect, all right? So just like water can be in a certain state, it can be liquid or solid or gas, human beings, you and me, also are in certain states, much more complex, but we are in certain states, all right? All right, so introspect for a second. Also, think about this. Humans behave in very predictable ways in virtue of these desires and beliefs and attitudes and tastes and so on. At least according to a lot of biology and psychology and neuroscience and so on. All right. Uh, okay, so think about that. All right, then. There's going to be only one there's going to be one and only one way then that you are going to react. And this is going to be necessitated or determined by the laws of nature and the facts about you at this moment. All right. You ready? Okay. Oh, my gosh. Dear Lord. Oh, my gosh. Uh-oh. 
Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. Oh, no. All right. So that's the overview of free will and determinism. What we're going to be exploring in the next few lectures in is the following. One, whether or not free will and determinism are compatible or incompatible. If they're compatible, well, then how should we understand free will? And if they're incompatible, what's more likely to be false, the free will thesis or determinism? And to find out, stay tuned.